Hey everybody, it's Matt Shu from Upright Health. Today, I wanted to go over a very clear, concise summary of what I think um, is going on with FAI, my general view and some general ideas for those of you who have, who have received um, that diagnosis or who fear that you may have this horrible, horrible uh, condition. Um, I get a lot of emails every week uh, from people who tell me they have cam impingement, they've got a labral tear, uh, the doctor said this, that, and the other thing, and that I need to get surgery to avoid um, developing really bad arthritis, um, because if that happens, then I'm going to need to get total hip replacement, and I don't want that either. Um, and then, uh, generally, people are asking me what I think they should do. So I want to lay out very clearly what I think about um, hip impingement. I've done it somewhat clearly in a previous video um, that a lot of people have watched, but this one I want to make very clear so that there is no question about what I'm talking about. So my first point is that I think the diagnosis makes no sense. Um, you know, and I've been in discussions about this with a radiologist that I'm working with. Um, I've had this discussion with YouTube users who uh, apparently don't like me and don't like my ideas. And in all these different discussions, uh, I have come to very strongly believe that the diagnosis really doesn't make sense. Um, and it's not just off the strength of the discussions, it's also based on the studies that we've discussed and looked at to determine whether or not there is anything to even diagnose with FAI. So, um, for everybody who tells me uh, I have x-ray proof of FAI, the first thing you need to know is that there is no relationship between the findings in an x-ray and whether or not you have symptoms. So, um, you can have, and there are links below where you can read up on this, but basically you could have x-ray evidence of FAI have absolutely zero symptoms. And this has been shown time and time again in actually pretty large sample sizes. So finding FAI in the x-ray doesn't mean anything. Um, it also, um, in terms of pain, doesn't mean anything. In terms of range of motion, also doesn't mean anything. Um, people often talk about the labral tears they get you know, they say, ah, oh, the labral tear must be causing all this pain. The doctor told me my labral tear is really messing me up. Um, so far in all the studies I've seen, there is no relationship between labral tears and pain. So you could have labral tears in your hips and you could experience absolutely zero pain. Uh, you could have labral tears for sure in your shoulders and also have no pain. And there's, there's actually a really good study um, that is referenced in the links below um, that talks about uh, professional pitchers, baseball pitchers, or labral tears, um, and no symptoms of any problems. So the labral tears don't cause the pain. The x-rays that show you cam impingement doesn't matter. There is no correlation to that in range of motion problems or pain. Um, also, uh, there is this discussion about arthritis. What's really interesting, and I've talked about this on my podcast, is that uh, when you look at um, when you look at this, there's this very large scale study done um, on knee arthritis and whether or not the X-ray evidence of arthritis correlated to actual pain. What you find is that there is no correlation. You could have you could have terrible, severe looking arthritis, bone spurs, narrowing joint spaces and still have no problem using the joint. Um, in, in another study, uh, what they found was rather than, um, rather than the important, the most important piece in determining whether or not somebody had good function um, wasn't how arthritic the joint appeared in x-rays, but actually had more to do with muscle strength. So that's something to keep in mind. So that all brings me to uh, my main point, which is that if the bone spurs can't cause the problem, right, the bone spurs apparently don't mean anything, the labral tears also don't mean anything, and the signs of FAI in an x-ray do not mean anything, if all those things don't mean anything and don't correlate to pain, don't correlate 
to um, range of motion problems, then you actually don't have anything to diagnose with. What you have is pain, for sure. The pain is definitely real. The irritation, the range of motion problems are real, but the things that we are attributing them, them those problems to, the things that we're saying are the cause, uh, apparently cannot be the cause because all the studies that have been done show that they, they don't even correlate, let alone cause uh, the problem. So I believe the approach has to be more focused on dealing with muscle activity. Um, that, that means basically you have to focus on proper muscle firing patterns, um, you have to work on strength in muscles that have atrophied, and I guarantee if you've been sitting and working at a desk job for any more than a few years, you have definitely gotten some atrophy that will severely affect hip function. Um, and you need to also relearn to recruit the right muscles during pretty fundamental motions. So, um, you know, a lot of the people I've worked with with FAI, when you ask them to do something as simple as hinging at the hips or squatting down, the uh, muscle recruitment patterns are pretty, pretty off very, very off, and it's a point of education for them to see uh, how much their adductors and how much their quads are over-recruited in simple, simple motions. Um, and then we then need to figure out how we can change that situation. Now, uh, when we're dealing with all the muscles, a very important point is that you have to deal with the individual person and how their body um, is basically used to moving. I have had some people who were diagnosed with FAI, had very mild symptoms, uh, and I mean, I don't even know how, I can't even believe they were given the FAI diagnosis because I generally think that gets re reserved for people who are in a severe situation, but apparently she had enough of the signs to get the FAI diagnosis. Um, by doing a little bit of tissue work and stretching, it was literally within about a month and a half, two months, she was, pretty much fine. Occasionally things will tighten back up, but all she has to do is release some things and the problem goes away. Easy for her, but I have other people that have taken months and months and months of just constantly retraining the right things to you know, loosen up uh, muscles, typically like adductors and quads that have gotten super, super tight, and then really try to restore the proper muscle firing patterns to muscles elsewhere. Um, for me, I was stabbing around in the dark for years. It's taken me a long time to get back to um, you know, what I consider really good function. Um, so for every individual, there's gonna be a lot of variables that you need to deal with. For me personally, there was so much cracking and popping and instability within the hip joint um, and pain in the knees, pain in the hips. Uh, not too much pain in the lower back, some, but not bad. Um, but just so much of this weird wobbly instability, restricted motion, tightness and weakness, aching and burning, it took me a very long time to address all the different angles of that um, once I even figured out what I should even try to do with them. So you need to look at each person at, on an individual basis. That means, uh, you know, the typical approach I hear about is like squatting and doing wall squats and BOSU ball squats and all these things. Um, to me, those things need to come way later because those things will tend to drive the incorrect uh, muscle patterns, right? Your, your muscles are gonna be firing the wrong way, especially if you're not paying attention to um, how you're doing the exercise. So a very, very clear example of this that I've seen time and time again is people who have gone through um, a lot of uh, physical therapy, they've been asked to do bridges and things, and clamshells to try to strengthen their glutes. Uh, and when they do them, I ask the simple question, do you feel your glutes firing while you're doing the bridge? And the answer is no, I don't know how to do that. After a couple minutes, after we talk about it a little bit and figure out how to trick their muscles to fire, then they're able to use them, then it becomes a therapeutic exercise. Only then does it become useful when the correct muscles are firing, right? It, it's just, if you're doing a motion that's firing off the wrong muscles and reinforcing the bad pattern, you're going to be driving yourself into a worse and worse situation. And I think that is something people need to know if they have already experienced, uh, you know, they've, they've hammered away at PT and found it wasn't useful for them. 
It doesn't mean that the physical muscular approach doesn't work. It just means that the way you are going about it may not have been appropriate for you. Um, so in general, what I tend to find, and this is again, can vary by the individual, but often the glutes and the hamstrings uh, tend to not be used well. Um, the adductors, quads tend to be used way too much. Hip flexors also tend to be over engaged. Um, all those things can lead to anterior tilts, can also lead to a forward migration of the femur in the hip socket, which is going to limit your range of motion in hip flexion. So if you can get the, the pelvis a little more posterior, and if you can loosen up some of the tension in the front of the hip, that's going to help allow the femur to sit back into the joint, which gives you more clearance for hip flexion. Um, so that is pretty much everything I wanted to cover on that. Um, I hope that gives you a little bit more insight into the problem and answers some questions that you may have about it. I do think for some people, if your lifestyle, meaning your uh, daily activities are, um, involve, are involving a lot of sitting, it can be very difficult to work your way out of this problem. It doesn't mean it's impossible, but you have to really work to re-engage the muscles that you're crushing all day um, to make sure that they start participating in more of your activities. I remember uh, looking, in, looking forward from when I was in my mid-20s, I remember looking forward and uh, wondering if I would ever be able to move my hips well, if I'd ever be able to lean forward to tie my shoes well again, if I'd be able to do, uh, you know, any of the things I love, like ice hockey, like lifting weights, like doing anything fun. Um, and I really had some serious doubts at the time. That's, you know, all these things that I just mentioned, those were my motivation to try to get back to life and to solve what was going on with my hips, trying to stabilize my hips, trying to help them move again, trying to help them um, not feel so tight and horrible all the time. Took me a long time to figure out. I was picking and choosing from anywhere I could find, basically, and doing random research all over the internet. Um, and eventually, I've gotten to the point where my hips feel pretty good, pretty darn good. I mean, I play ice hockey now. I can lift weights. I'm doing the things that I want to be doing, and I did not have to get cut open. So I'm hoping that the ideas that I'm putting out here for you you find helpful, that you're able to start to strategize and to think about what you need to do um, to really start making some forward progress. Um, it's really important to realize that progress is possible. So I hope you remember that and I hope you remember that pain sucks. Life should.